uh, great energy, we're going to move on to uh, our next presentation. And I have uh, the privilege of introducing to you a group of our colleagues who are from Queen's University. Uh, and uh, this is Dr. Claire Davies, Dr. Beata Batorovich, and Dr. Stephen Dobry, who are gonna join us today to present on the convergence of medical and assistive technologies. Um, hopefully we'll have a bit of time for questions as well. Uh, and I believe uh, as I pass it over to you, Claire, Claire, you're going to be facilitating the Q&A uh, for your group, is that correct? That's fine, yeah. Excellent, okay, so I welcome, have at it. Thank you very much. So I'll be presenting on convergence of assistive devices and medical technologies. As we were introduced, Stefan Dobry and Beata Betterowicz will be doing their introductions themselves. But I'm Claire Davies, an associate professor at Queen's University, and I'm a white cis woman with shoulder length blonde hair and blue eyes. I'm in my mid forties and I'm wearing a green top for this Zoom session today. Yeah. So today we'll be talking about three different things. We're actually separating it out into three different areas. And I will be talking about medical devices versus assistive technologies and as move through three different examples of how medical devices and assistive technologies seem to slowly be merging together and how we're going to actually integrate those moving forward and how society is integrating those moving forward. Next, Stefan Dobry will be talking about interdisciplinary education, and he'll be talking specifically about the Building Better Together program, the benefits and challenges of a program that we've been doing for about seven years now. And then um, Beata will be talking about accessible augmentative and alternative communication and some work that we had funded by Accessible Standards Canada. So let's get started. The World Health Organization has a series of definitions to define health technology. So health technology is actually that umbrella term that uh, medical devices and assistive technologies both fill within. So when you talk about health technology, they're actually talking about the application of organized knowledge and skills that are specifically in the form of devices, medicines, vaccines, procedures, and systems that are developed to help solve a health problem as well as improve quality of life. And oftentimes it's used interchangeably with healthcare technology. So on the medical devices side, what we've got is an article or instrument that is used in the prevention, diagnosis or treatment of any illness or disease, or for treating, detecting, measuring, restoring or correcting the body functions so, or the structure of the body for some health purpose. So when we talk about medical devices, they tend to be things that are more implanted. So your hip implants or your knee implants, even teeth implants are another form of medical technology. So those are the things that we're talking about when we talk about medical devices. Now, assistive devices tend to be those that are any external device that are generally available. So the primary purpose of your assistive device is to maintain or improve the individual's functioning and independence and thereby promote their well-being. So assistive technology or products are also used to prevent impairments as, sec as well as secondary health conditions. Now, in the past, assistive technology has traditionally been considered external to the human body and non-invasive, but now we're starting to see the field is converging and we're seeing medical technologies integrated into assistive devices and vice versa. So several of the emerging assistive devices include things like implants and other products that would qualify as medical devices with many moving beyond that assistance towards augmentation and recovery of missing functions. So let's start with this. Prostheses have been found as early as 950 BC to 710 BC. So prostheses have been used for a long time. And from that perspective, we've come a long way from using a wooden post for a leg or a simple hook like Pete and Peter Pan. The image on the left shows a typical prosthesis in which a sock is placed on the residual limb. So you've got a sock that's placed on the residual limb socket. It's measured and usually through scanning to actually get the sock produced. And the silicon liner acts so that a prosthesis can be put onto that particular limb through suction. 
As you can see from the image on the left, what we're seeing is an x-ray of the alignment of that particular leg. And you can see that it's not really perfectly aligned. There's misalignment in that. The problem being with the misalignment in that, it affects the hip and the rest of the body as well. So it's important that we try and get that alignment right. So one of the methods that has been used more recently is a method called osseointegration. So in this particular case, what they're actually doing is they're sticking a post into the residual bone of that particular individual. And that post extends beyond the body. From that post, they can now, um, now place a prosthesis on the end of it. So they can screw a prosthesis on the end. And so now you've got a limb that is better aligned and might prevent hip problems in the future. Now, one of the biggest things that we run into issues here is that you've got problems with deep tissue or superficial injury and infections as a result of this particular um, prosthesis. But what we're seeing is we're seeing that the merging of the medical devices and technology with respect to prosthesis needs are moving forward in an interdisciplinary with involvement from both doctors as well as prosthetists. So moving on a little bit, we're looking now at brain computer interfaces. So what is brain computer interface? So in this particular case, the image that I've shown here is known as a feedback control loop within engineering. So the brain knows what it actually needs to control to make its actions move. In order to do that, there's an ele electrical activity that exists within the brain to take the signals and send them from the brain to different parts of the body. The brain takes that information and provides these signals to the muscles. The muscles then act to create movement. And once the muscles are activated, the movement, the person can move their arms or their legs or even their fingers or cheek muscles to smile. Now sensors, typically the sense of smell or touch, sound, allows your brain to actually make any corrections that you need to do along the way. And your brain goes back and re re um, issues those commands to the rest of your body. Now this image shows the a method that's used within our laboratory to collect the brain signals. Using electrodes, this picture shows uh, 164 electrodes that are actually located on that person. Um, but we use systems that use as few as five electrodes. So within that particular, we actually um, are seeing all the channels of that particular individual on that decode intent concept. So we have used as few as five electrodes. And what we're seeing is the electrical signals from every single one of those electrodes that are placed on that person's head. So you can see some have greater impact and some have lower impact. And that's all dependent on where the electrical activity is coming from within that time frame. So this is known as an, electro, uh, an electroencephalograph. Oh, <laughs> this is known as electroencephalography. So what that is, is it's a collection of all those images of all the different signals that are put together into a graphical format. And so this is what we're actually seeing here. And so this step often includes um, computer algorithms, or as we heard earlier, artificial intelligence to work out what the brain is telling the person to do. And so these signals are the same every single time the person thinks of the same thing. So if you're thinking about moving your arm left, then those signals will always be the same. Or moving right, the signals will always be the same. So we can train the computer to detect these repetitive signals so the computer can help you interact with other aspects of your daily life, like an environmental control unit, perhaps. So effectively, a brain-computer interface is a system that allows signals from the brain to be detected and enable interaction within the environment, whether it's interaction with a keyboard or an environmental unit to control lights or a wheelchair, doors into a house, any of those types of things. So now let's look at how does it work. So this is actually a five electrode system that you actually see here. And we've been studying the collection of electrical signals within the brain using electrodes that are on the edge on the top of the surface of the scalp. And from these signals, we can decode the we can decode the intent of that particular person who is using the device. Now, unfortunately, we have found with our work with children that it's very, very difficult to actually control that device or to create signals that are always repeatable 
And so one of the biggest things is trying to ensure that the, the child is interacting with the system effectively, but also that the system is detecting what it's supposed to be detecting. And so oftentimes when people have a disability of some sort, the brain doesn't function in the same way it does as the average person, as we learned from Utah's presentation, it's a little bit different and it uses neuroplasticity to accomplish different functions. So what we now need to do is we need to find out where those electrodes on the head should actually be placed in order to allow that detection of the signals that are coming from the most efficient place. So in this particular case, you can see one with five electrodes and we found that didn't work at all. The one that we have found that has worked for one or two individuals out of about eight is one that has 16 electrodes. Now what we're trying to do is take a, an entire set of electrodes, and we're actually looking at about 64, and we're integrating those to try and figure out how do we get a personalized system so that you can put the, your own electrodes on your head where your signals are strongest. And so that's what we're working towards now. So we've found that it's very important for each brain computer interface to be designed for the individual who is going to be using it. And because of your plasticity of the brain, especially for persons with disabilities, we are moving forward to make them individualized to allow better learning. So let's just look at the signals of a person who has typically developed up until now. This image actually shows what's happening in the brain. I know it's kind of hard to understand when I say, yeah, these are the electrical signals that are actually occurring. It makes it difficult to understand what is actually happening. So this is what happens when a person recognizes their friend. So if you look at the top of the image, there's the nose of the individual and you can see there are two ears on the side of the individual. So there's, there's five different images that, reproduce, that represent five different time frames after the initial showing of a stimulus. And that stimulus is a photograph of, an of a friend of that individual. So what you're seeing is that the colors represent the positive and the negative electrical signals from within the brain. These images actually show the combined effects of about 20 or 30 people. So this is, this is a representation of a group of people, not an individual. And so it's looking at it from the person, the time is the person has shown the image at a, and then 120 seconds immediately. And what you're seeing is that the negative activity actually occurs at the beginning of the, the image. As soon as the person is shown the image, what you're seeing is the positive electrical um, activity moving throughout the brain for 170 milliseconds, so very short time frame, and then that dissipates to the back of the brain. So these are some signals that we can use. Using this information, we can actually use a computer to analyze these signals and then help us control one of these systems that we talked about. So up until now, I've been focused on those systems that are externally mounted, and those can be classed as assistive technology. However, on the left, we have an image that is a system that is mounted within the brain itself. It's a very tiny sensor. You can see it's about four millimeters by four millimeters. And on that sensor is an array of tiny little sensors that do exactly the same thing as my electrodes on this previous image. And so at this point, we're now moving from assistive technology into medical devices. And this device has actually been used. There is evidence of one individual who is able to use this implanted device as of 2021 to learn how to use this device to communicate with individuals, to effectively to use it to type on a keyboard and allow him to um, communicate with others. He spent 50 sessions at one and a half, at, at half hour each during 81 weeks of the study. So he was able to achieve a 75% success rate at 15 words a minute using this implanted system. Now our head, plant, head mounted system that didn't require the implantation of these sensors allowed our particular clients to type at two words per minute after 10 weeks. So those are the trade-offs. If you're going to wanting to look at 15 words a minute and have an implant versus two words a minute and not have the implant, but still improving because we're only 10 weeks in. So those are the things that you need to think about um, without the stress of the surgery, it might be better to use a head mounted system. I'm not sure how quickly this shift will occur, 
but it is one of those things of the future. People will have brain computer interfaces implanted within their brains. I'm going to talk about one more system, and this is an ultrasound, ultrasound vision system. And I'm actually going to ask Beata to actually just, oh, sorry, Beata, can you go to the next one? Can you hit the, the, the video, please, on this particular? Okay, well, if we don't get the video, what is effectively happening here is a device that um, was developed during my PhD studies. And what we actually did was this is um, our friend, Chris Orr, and he was a friend of ours um, who was completely blind. And so what he actually did is, this is the very first time that he used this device. And it's an ultrasound transmitter that's in his hand and in, at his head on earphones is mounted two ultrasound receivers. And they're oriented outwards, which, which is a little different than other systems that are currently out there. And this is a head mounted system that could also be used with um, uh, hearing aids. So the same sort of thing could be used as a hearing aid. And so what this gentleman actually does is this is the first time he goes on a walk with this device and you actually see him detect the trees up above him. So he reaches up to the trees with his cane because he's completely um, visually impaired, he's completely blind, reaches up to the trees with his cane, realizes they're there and manages to duck under them as he continues on his walk. So this is an ultrasound Doppler system that provides signals to the individual with little to no training. So as he moves forward, the relative difference between the ultrasound signals is presented. And if he stands still, he doesn't actually hear anything. So he can hear obstacles within his environment, but not external to his, uh, sorry, within his environment as he is moving. But if he, does, if he stops moving, then he doesn't hear anything. Um, have we lost the images? Oh, we're back. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Good. All right. So moving forward, um, we're looking at something that's getting to be a little bit more sci-fi as I noticed in the chat while I was talking. So this was an external mounted system that I developed during my PhD. Now, as you go on to the next slide, what we're seeing is um, an Argus II retinal prosthesis. And so the Argus II is a prosthetic device that was approved in 2013 by the United States Federal, Federal FDA <laughs> as a humanitarian device that can be used for end-stage retin retin uh, retinosis pig retinitis pigmentosis, sorry. And so the idea about this is the device is used to replicate some function of the eye. So in this particular case, an electrode array is placed within the eye and it's a little camera and it has an external video processing unit. So here we're getting the combination of your um, implant as well as your assistive technology. So you're getting a little bit of both because your external system has to be on the outside. And the idea is that it sends a series of electrical pulses and those pulses are delivered to whatever surviving on the retinal um, neurons through this electrode array. And as a result, the person can see different light forms, but that's pretty much all they can see is different light forms. And so the highest visual acuity achieved in this particular case is 20 by 546. So you're aiming for a 20 by 20 if you've got perfect vision. I don't know how many of us have perfect vision nowadays, but the idea is 2200 is what they actually try to be seeking in this particular case. Now, the last system I'm actually gonna mention is a retinal enhancement. And that one briefly, just, this goes all the way to the medical side. And so this, in this case, you're actually taking uh, photocells, 3000 microscopic photocells and putting them on a silicon chip, chip. So they often call this a bionic eye. So the rationale between this particular placement of the subretinal implant is that that positioning of the device can um, um, ignite or, or help the degenerated um, retinal, uh, um, retin, retina and the intrinsic signal will produce a capacity that's more similar to the retinal intraneurons that already existed for that particular individual. So it's a more physiological form of vision rather than just different lights. Having said that, it's um, got a long way to go. So the device is situated nice and close to the retina 
and has achieved retinal um, stimulation, which allows that particular retina to show images to that particular individual. Now, it has not been approved in Canada or the United States, but it has been approved in Europe for the use of this particular device. The acuity of this particular device is a little better than the Argus that we were talking on, about on the earlier, and in this case, it's 20 to 364. So 20 over 364. So that's still an improvement on what was previously done. But it, they're also saying that one of the biggest problems in this particular case is unlike uh, retinal um, transplantation or anything like that, the doctor has to be very accurate and they need to have different skills in order to um, put the device on the individual. So it does create a little bit of um, discussion between the doctors and the surgeons as to how best to do this particular device. So again, this is another medical device that is a form of assistive technology, but is moving towards complete augmentation and um, support to that particular visu visually impaired individual. So let's move on and look at exactly what are we looking at when we're talking about medical devices versus assistive technology. Assistive devices can now actually include an implantable component. So we may need to look at the definition and scope of what we're saying when we talk about assistive technology. What's this new form of technology that actually merges the two and it's converging? And who actually approves it? Because oftentimes the FDA will approve medical devices and not need to approve assistive technology. So now we need to look at who's regulating this type of technology. The next question we have to have, ask is, is it ethical? Is it ethical to have a brain computer interface or an implant that is actually inside your brain helping to detect those signals and where to from there? So these are questions we have to talk about. And lastly, what about safety? As soon as you're starting to interact with that particular body, the human body, you're inter interacting with devices that can cause rejection or inflammation or cause that body harm. And we need to look at how can we ensure the best, safest methods of implementation while achieving the best outcome. So I'm going to thank you very much right there. And I'm actually going to move directly on to Stefan Dobry. We are going to ask, have all our questions done at the end of this session rather than at interacting in the middle. All right, thanks, Claire. And hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Stefan Dobry, and I'll be presenting today about building better together. I am a white cis man in my late 20s. I have rectangular frame glasses on. I've got shoulder length, curly, kind of frizzy, light brown hair, and a curled mustache with a goatee. I get compared to one of the three musketeers fairly regularly. So what is building better together or BBT? It's an interdisciplinary course at Queen's University between the School of Rehabilitation and the Department of Mechanical and Materials Engineering. So groups are composed of students in their second year of their master's in occupational therapy and students in their third year of biomechanical engineering. Groups have different volunteer clients recruited from the local community for whom they create an assistive device for a need identified by the client. Uh, there's an emphasis on creating 3D printed prototypes for each client However, other options are available for creating prototypes. So I've got two examples now. Um, so the first one we'll talk about uh, Sam. So Sam is a 30 year old with cerebral palsy who uses AAC to communicate and uh, Viata is gonna be talking about AAC a lot more in her section. Um, so Sam's favorite leisure activity is playing cards, uh, but they were unable to play independently. Specifically, they had problems holding the cards um, so their play partners couldn't see them. And they also experienced uh, pain when they try, were trying to hold or squeeze the cards. And the aim of this project for them was to design an assistive, assistive device that will allow all card players and their caregivers to play independently, minimizing obstructions to the game regardless of physical ability. As per the client's needs, the product had to be sturdy, non-obtrusive, portable, include a simplistic ergonomic design, and hold 10 to 12 playing cards. So existing solutions such as commercially available card holders and a modified Kleenex box Sam had used previously didn't actually meet their needs. So students designed this card holder you can see on screen. Um, 
So it's a new card holder that consists of three different bodies that fold into one compact and portable device. Uh, the bodies are connected by pin hinges and they have a two tiered design. So there are two rows of cards and each tier had a magnetic surface that magnetic cards could adhere to also with a bottom lip, lip to prevent slippage of non-magnetic cards. So the final design was successfully printed and shipped to the client to allow for a hands-on experience with the device. And Sam was extremely pleased with the outcome and said the new design changed their life. So now I'll talk about another one. Um, so Alex is a teenager with Palisaeus Marsbacher disease uh, and developmental delays. So Alex has motor control difficulties which make drinking from cups and bottles difficult. So they use a CP cup that you can see on the, like the one on the left side of the screen. So Alex wanted something more age appropriate for drinking and three different teams worked with Alex to create their own designs. So one group designed a new bottle which would match the existing sippy cup lid. Um, so there's that one there. So they designed the new bottle and just made it so the threads match so that you could use a sippy cup lid, but then you've got a bottle that's a little bit more age appropriate for Alex. Um, another group designed a rigid sleeve with handles that could slip over a specific commercially available reusable water bottle. So that just made it a little bit easier to grip the water bottle. And a third group designed a soft sleeve with a rigid handle that could fit over multiple commercially available reusable water bottles. And that soft sleeve and rigid handle had been shipped to Alex and we're waiting to get feedback on this side. So why did we choose occupational therapy and engineering? So both engineers and occupational therapists have a role in designing, building, and providing access to assistive technology. And people with disabilities uh, often report challenges in accessing functional, affordable, and appropriate assistive technology when they need it. When devices are prescribed, they're often not used, uh, typically due to a lack of fit between the person, the environment, and their equipment. Working together, occupational therapists can use their skills to determine what the end user needs and how to assess if those needs are being met by a device, while the engineers can do the designing and the building of the assistive devices themselves. So interdisciplinary collaboration comes with a lot of benefits and challenges. Some of the benefits include having a larger base of expertise from different disciplines, more diverse ideas and perspectives which contribute to the design process. And for students who typically work only with other students in their disciplines, it reflects real, real workspaces more accurately. Some of the challenges include discipline specific language which can hinder communication, differing expectations of what is important for the client or the project, and a lack of collaboration between the disciplines. So I'm now going to present some of the work done to analyze interdisciplinary collaboration in the context of BBT. This work was completed by Katie Van Til for her master's thesis. So BBT group meetings were video and audio recorded in fall 2017. Uh, audio recordings were transcribed and anonymized and four groups were selected for analysis. Two of the goals of this work were to explore behaviors exhibited during interdisciplinary collaboration and to determine if there were links between collaboration strengths and assignment grades. So two researchers independently coded transcripts using the content analysis based on the competencies set out by the Canadian Interprofessional Health Collaborative or CIHC. The codes were listed as facilitators or inhibitors and grouped into three themes, interprofessional knowledge, partnership, and task focus. So some of the facilitating behaviors included accessing others' knowledge, when students would ask questions to each other, professional role clarification, when students gained more information about the other discipline and what they could or couldn't do, transfer of knowledge, when students shared their own discipline-specific knowledge with other group members, integration of competencies, when students combined skills from the different disciplines during design, Role review, when students clarified expectations and tasks assigned to different group members. Some of the inhibiting behaviors included doubting ability, when students doubted the abilities of other group members to complete different tasks. Lack of cohesion, when there wasn't an integration of competencies in the group. Frustration with the course, when students focused on issues with the course rather than on completing the project. Task confusion, when students did not understand a task and did not seek clarification. And teams with more facilitators and fewer inhibitors were classified as having stronger collaboration. 
So there was a positive correlation between collaboration strength and assignment grades. The groups that had stronger collaboration had better grades on their group assignments, which is something you pr would probably assume. So I'll now talk to some qualitative observations from the most recent offering of BBT in the winter 2022 term. Uh, the term was originally going to be entirely in-person, but was shifted to online for the first six weeks. So groups worked together to design devices for their clients in weeks one to nine of the term. So two thirds of that time together was online. Uh, it's important to note that group meetings were not recorded and no data has been analyzed for this term. These are just some observations from the teaching team. So offering this course online has very, or was very different than offering it in person, and this came with some benefits and challenges. So some of the benefits included having a broader geographic base for recruiting participants. We typically recruit from the Kingston community to facilitate in-person meetings, but since all meetings were online, we were able to reach out to a broader group of potential clients, and this year most of them were situated in the greater Toronto area. So we found it was sometimes easier to arrange meetings online than in person since there were no travel requirements for clients or students. Um, also, the challenges of online learning in a course like this required some extra creative thinking from the students, especially for client interviews and assessments. Some of the challenges included uh, less team interaction. So there was less downtime where students were together, whether before meeting started or on their way to or from a meeting. Uh, and social interactions are just different online compared to in person. So performing assessments of clients' abilities were much more difficult online than in person, and a lot of groups struggled with this. Some of them were unable or unwilling to put in the extra creative thinking to perform these assessments effectively. We also had limited access to prototyping. When the course is delivered in person, students have access to a makerspace, which they can use at their leisure for prototyping. Prototypes could also be given directly to the clients during meetings. With the online course, the teaching team had to complete any 3D printing of prototypes and ship them to the clients. So these restrictions decreased the amount of time students had to prototype to allow for the shipping of prototypes to clients prior to group meetings and the number of times that students could print prototypes. So we observed many of the same behaviors this year than in previous years. I'm sorry, I'm just plugging in my laptop, as well as some behaviors unique to online learning. So groups that appeared to have the strongest collaboration and created the most effective prototypes worked together to overcome challenges of online client meetings. This included creating of think, thinking of creative ways to complete assessments of the client's function and present and get feedback on different designs. Additionally, these groups stayed engaged in online meetings, keeping their videos on and using their time together effectively. Some inhibiting behaviors included keeping videos off during meetings. Uh, groups who consistently had their videos off seemed to struggle more. Uh, some groups also used challenges of online learning as a bit of an excuse to not complete work. So instead of trying to adjust their assessments of the clients uh, and their designs from groups, uh, some groups just said the assessments couldn't be done and stated what they would have done in person. Some groups had poor communication with the client as well. Uh, groups often used technical language clients didn't understand. Uh, didn't phrase questions well or just didn't and or didn't use their time meeting with their client effectively. For example, some completed their list of questions before the meeting time had finished and rather than using the time to ask follow-up questions to the client or give the client more time to give them feedback, uh, groups would go off topic and chat about other things. Uh, so with that, I will pass it on to the So hello everyone, I am Biata Batarovic. I'm, I am an assistant um, professor at Queen's University in rehabilitation science and I'm an occupational um, therapist. Um, I am a white woman with short light brown hair and green eyes in my 50s and I wear glasses right now and I do so when I work on the computer. Um, I will talk today about augmentative and alternative communication and our joint project with um, Claire Davis concerning making augmentative and alternative communication accessible in Canada. So for those who are not familiar, augmentative and alternative communication or for short AAC refers to technology and strategies that can support people who are not independent communicators in 
all communicative situations. So AAC can either augment existing speech, uh, for example, for people whose speech is difficult to understand by others, or replace oral language for those who have very limited or no speech. AAC provides a passable way of communication that enables and supports individuals to learn, interact with other people and participate in society. And the why, a variety of AAC systems are available. And the literature AAC is described as unaided and aided. So I just wanted to mention that, that unaided means using gestures, pointing with fingers or eyes or facial expressions, ways we all um, use to communicate um, using our body. And the aided communication, which we'll focus on today, involves um, communication aids. So the external supports for communication, those are system with physicals or virtual boards that use text, figures, icons to symbolize everyday activities, people, actions, places, and objects to represent language. And AAC systems can be, for example, printed communication books or communication like lab tree displays or electronic devices that generate speech. And they can be accessed in different ways for technology, uh, either directly by pointing or by interfaces and switches or any other way that Claire already explained and described in an earlier um, um, talk in a, just a moment ago. So efficiency and time it takes to communicate using current AAC technology and systems has been really recognized as a challenge. Um, and it is something that it's really important in the AAC field to consider. And we all talk about time and the lack of time and the challenges in time and timing when using AAC technologies in everyday life interactions, real life interactions, not in clinical settings. So the emerging research evidence in the field of AAC has indicated that first, there is an issue of a high cost and lack of reliable AAC technology and devices. And also many people discontinue the use of AAC technology and devices. And secondly, the social networks of people who rely on AAC are extremely limited, mostly to close family members and professionals. And children have limited peer interactions. So also studies reported very limited social participation. The few studies that focus on employment um, reported lack of opportunities and very uh, limited accommodations for people who rely or could benefit from augmentative and alternative communication. And there has been little research on social participation outside of work and school environments. Therefore, um, there is limited information, and especially in Canada, we have very little information on AAC systems and uh, access to them and services across Canada, across the different provinces. So the purpose of our project was to identify the key areas of importance with respect to the design and use of AAC systems that could support people that may benefit from AAC system or use AAC system. We wanted to hear from experts from all of the stakeholders group. So people who use augmentative communication, caregivers and people who work with augmentative and alternative communication. So they could be speech language pathologists, educators, um, designers, manufacturers, whoever is involved in service delivery and recommendations in regards to AAC systems and their setup. Our goal was to have representation and voice from all the provinces included, as well as two languages, um, English and French. As the first step, um, it's a larger study, but today I'm going to talk a little bit about the first step. We conducted focus groups and interviews. We asked questions about use and design of AAC systems. So we had in total 43 participants, and most took part in mixed focus groups as to province representation. We look very hard to reach to all provinces. However, we did not have, unfortunately, any representation from PEI and their territories. Um, service provider included a range of speech language pathologies, occupational therapies, communication disorder assistance, educate, educators and manufacturers. And to analyze data, we are using reflexive thematic analysis and the analysis is still in progress and I'm able to present today some preliminary findings. 
So all groups of experts talk about multiple barriers to accessing AAC services and technology, and data highlights fragmented services, um, local discrepancies, and overall limited access and choices for people and families that may seek um, augmented and alternative communication. All groups discuss organizational and institutional barriers related to accessing professionals, devices, or financial support and prohibitive costs of such technologies and challenges in accessing resources. While participants talked about technology, the good and bad of technology, they also focus on social issues predominantly related to people's lack of knowledge about augmentative and alternative communication attitudes, misunderstanding, underestimation of their abilities and desires to be recognized and included in um, society. Today, I'm going to highlight some of the key findings from the group of uh, people that use AAC and caregivers specifically. So persons who use AAC talked about the importance of system and devices in their life. Um, they often describe the impact of um, augmentative and alternative communication as a life-changing event, as illustrated in this quote. AAC has changed my life. I was lonely and had given up on a good future, but now I feel loved by many loving people because I can talk with them. I had no way to express that. I was bored and needed to learn with others. So these participants also talk about the experience at school um, and the fact that they didn't have opportunities, he didn't have opportunities to be included with other children while at school. So another team um, which concerns misunderstanding and underestimation of abilities of people who rely on AAC. So participants talked quite a bit about negative experiences at school. One said that the others treated him as he was stupid. Participants also talk about necessity to leave school and be um, and learn at home due to the lack of resources and supports uh, for augmentative and alternative communication. They also reported their frustrations because people do not provide time to express themselves in social situations. So it's a fast paced society we live in and the time is of essence and the communication using KAC takes more time. So the people are impatient to engage in interactions with them um, when they talk over them and about them as expressed by one of the participants being talked over, about and over, and not being able to fully express myself due to the pressure to be fast in social situations. Similarly, caregivers overwhelmingly talked about how other people, especially those outside of the close family members and close friends circle, underestimated the abilities of persons who rely on AC, especially their cognitive abilities, and also limited their communication choices to expressing basic messages. To illustrate, one caregiver said, uh, how insulting to them is it for us to assume that they only ever want to say, I want, I feel. Along the attitudes and knowledge of others, access to AAC, meaning both services and devices, was from the perspective of people who rely on AAC, one of the biggest barriers, as shown in this quote from the participant. The biggest barrier is belief and access. One must demonstrate an ability that it will be successful before getting access through government. These participants also indicated further that to get access to services in Canada, some prerequisites need to be met. So that expectation is to show success in using a device for communication before you're given a chance to try it and practice and learn it. Caregivers also raised the same concern. Uh, my son was not qualified for the AAC clinic there because of the clinical guidelines. So just ridiculous irony, like how crazy is that, right? Parents also talk about the general assumptions and limited opportunities or how persons who use AAC are held to different standards. As one mother said, the underlying assumption is that there is no more, that the system is good enough and you can ask for juice and go to the toilet and your life is pretty good. Go fold some towels, you know. Caregiver also voiced their concerns about acceptance of AAC and understanding that it is a valid way of communicating. 
And the problem that the devices are not accessible in all settings. Um, they are often put away by others. And especially this is a concern for a person who need assistance to position the device uh, precisely to be able to use it. They talk about the constant need to advocate and their worries about what will happen if they are not around anymore as caregivers, as their children are adults and they will get older. They also discuss restrictions um, uh, as only certain types of technology and devices or system are funded in some provinces. And it is unclear how this is determined and how this issue excludes many from access and using AAC. In terms of technology, caregivers talked about importance of matching the systems to the specific needs of each unique person, rather than following hype on new technology. And this came up in the before talk as well. The, this quote illustrates how I guess technology might not be most appropriate for all as this mother describes her daughter as shaker and mover, referring to her physical abilities. And thus I guess does not work for her. And everybody was trying to get um, her to, to try it again and again and over and over as the new technologies. Another technology barrier mentioned by caregivers was integration of technology for mobility, driving and uh, wheelchair and communication um, and a very difficult choice to make. One caregiver's daughter selected talking or driving. Parents also talk about frequent breakdowns of technology and inability to replace devices they needed with limited financial support. They discuss problems of not having opportunity to keep old systems, which they are actually familiar with, as technology keep changing and system become obsolete. These challenges may pose tremendous um, issues for people who rely on AAC. Caregivers express many hopes, things that they wish could change, some related directly to technology and some to change in policies and creating standards for practices that support inclusion of people who rely on AAC in society. They talk about communication as human right. And uh, one parent said, there are wheelchairs, there are crutches, there are glasses, there are hearing aids. Why are some access issues not easily understood and others access issues so misinformed or unwell? and their value and disregarded. Lastly, people who use AAC express their multiple aspirations and desires. Some of the, the mentioned access and accessibility, but most of them talk actually about social inclusion, having friends and contributing to society. For example, they said, we are looking to be seen as intelligent and long to be included. I want to be able to communicate with people in my communities and socialize, have more friends that are not in the AEC field, having more social relationship and contributing to the future of others. To summarize, we see some common threads in the preliminary findings, which relate to importance of AEC as it provides possibility for communication, social relationships and participation in society, yet, there is lack of knowledge about AAC and people who use AAC and who can benefit from AAC. This concerned a range of people not having only, not only a general public and society and unfamiliar people, but also professionals. And there is also lack of access to AAC systems and services. We are getting a sense how they are fragmented very locally and in different provinces, um, how the access in urban areas is very limited. Well, is, is have actually, actually is there access to urban area, but in rural areas, it's very limited. So where do we go next? Um, based on the findings, uh, we're finalizing the analysis uh, from the focus groups and we next will conduct a Delphi study to seek consensus across Canada from all groups of stakeholders as to priorities on design and use of AAC systems to support social participation. Um, our goal is to inform development of accessibility standards uh, for AAC in Canada, and we hope to contribute to better understanding of the importance um, from the stakeholders' perspective. So we'll have more to report in the near future. And um, for now, thank you for your attention. And now I would like to open the floor to any questions at this time and would like to um, 
remind uh, the audience that the questions uh, can relate to any of the three of us and the three presentations. So thank you. Thank you very much, Viada. Now, I do not see any questions just yet. <gasps> Thank you. All right, so first of all, I've got a question that asked specifically about the talk that I gave that said, would the prosthesis be permanent if it is drilled into the bone? So what is drilled into the bone is actually a stump. So it's, it's effectively a cylinder that is drilled into the bone that supports the prosthesis. So really the, it's not permanent, it still gets removed and it gets removed regularly from the people who actually do wear them. Um, but they use the um, stump that is still sticking out from where the end of their um, residual limb stays in there the whole time. So that stays in, but the prosthesis can be changed and um, modified and you can use different feet or different leg supports to enable that prosthesis to work effectively. Hopefully that clarifies. So if each of the panelists, so the question is, could each of the panelists reflect on how the research has, in, research has impacted their own worldviews in general? Oh my goodness, that's a good question. I don't know whether I should start or whether I should let everybody else start. Um, uh, yes, I mean, from my perspective, uh, a lot of the work that I do, I, I'm heavily involved in the Building Better Together, heavily involved in the, the ASC. Um, as well as all the obvious um, merge convergence of medical technologies and medical devices. And to be honest, the one thing that I really think is most important from a worldview perspective is training engineers to actually talk to stakeholders. I think the hardest part that I have, uh, the hardest thing that I have found when I've been working with um, persons with disabilities. Now I started working um, as a volunteer with persons with disabilities in 1988 at what was then uh, Blurview, um, Blurview Children's Hospital, it's now Blurview Kids Rehab. Um, and at the time it, it was, it actually made me um, go into engineering for that, per, for that perspective. I just wanted to be able to help these kids with interacting with their environment. And as I got trained as an engineer, and as I went on to my master's and my PhD, I found that along the way, the engineers are designing all these great devices, but they're no good because they don't actually talk to the stakeholders. And so that's where the Building Better Together program came from, is we need to get these people talking to other people so that they can actually understand where the needs are coming from. And I think that's most important from all perspectives. I'm going to let um, Dr. Baderowicz go next, if she'd like, so she's there. Okay, I'm here, sorry. <laughs> A little bit uh, maneuvering to unmute myself. Um, um, yeah, so the question was about how the research impacted me. Well, I must go even back uh, earlier, I first was a practitioner uh, as an occupational therapist. I practiced uh, right after I graduated uh, many years ago, three decades ago <laughs> in uh, from occupational therapy. I practiced in the field of augmentative and alternative communication and with technology. So the technology was very different. So, and then right away, there was like so many unanswered questions. Why do we do certain things? Why, so I, so I started to do research very early on. So the impact of the research with people just taught me to be really very humble and 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 I I think realizing that technology is as as it as I think it's very well illustrated in our study that I talked today about with Claire that technology is a part of it right it's an it's it's just like a it's means it's a very important uh, uh, undoubtedly mean uh, for for many people um, in terms of um, fostering their independence, helping and supporting and or communication, but it's means so so listening to um, people and their choices and preferences 
it's critical and it's so important. And, and, and really the true, we talk about the client-centered practice, right? And, and also client-centered research and what does it mean for us as therapists? It, it, it's really, truly, it is the unique um, design which came up in a few talks today for every person. We are all different and just respecting that and, and listening. So I think that what's research with um, uh, people in this field and technology and, and people with disabilities taught me. Just being put on a spot. <laughs> Stefan. <laughs> Um, so I'd echo what Claire was saying, um, just the importance of getting engineers to actually work with the end user. Um, I remember a surgeon that I worked with uh, some years ago, once he said engineers like by themselves will come up to, with brilliant solutions to problems that don't exist. Um, and that's something that I have seen like throughout my schooling and everything is just people coming up with really interesting solutions but they don't necessarily fit a problem someone actually has, or even if they've included the client um, at the beginning of the design process, um, they don't really take any feedback later on. They just kind of go, well, I'm the engineer. I know the design the best. Um, I'm going to make something that's fantastic for you and don't really include the uh, end user in any other steps. Uh, so it's really important to have that sort of user-centered design and really focus on what people actually need um, rather than what you think will work for them. Um, so that's a really big one. And then also just with interdisciplinary collaboration, that's really important. I found um, in my undergrad and with uh, other courses that I've taught and everything, there aren't that many chances for interdisciplinary collaboration unless you're like seeking out those things outside of your schooling. Um, so that's a really important thing to get engineers comfortable with like working with diverse teams and not just thinking like okay as an engineer I'm going to be working with other engineers on whatever I'm you know working on in the future um, so getting people used to that and really able to work in those situations is really really needed to develop like good AAC and everything like that thank you both so uh, the next question that we had was with implanted devices, do people need to take anti-rejection medications to prevent rejection? Now I'm gonna be perfectly honest and say that I don't do a whole lot of research in this area. So I am going to say I would assume so, at least at the initial stages, but I don't know if it needs to get continued on from forever. So I'll give, uh, I'm sorry if that doesn't sufficiently answer your questions, but unfortunately you're gonna to have to look it up because that's what I'm gonna to have to do too. Um, moving on, there was another question that said, do the people you work with ask what will happen next with their contribution? And if so, how do you feel this type of question? And I'm actually going to start with Stefan on this one because it's easy for her to, him to answer it and then we'll take over after that. Yeah, so in terms of the BBT, um, a decent number of students ask like, um, what will happen with these devices once we're actually done the course. And what Claire has typically done is have summer students work throughout the summer to take some devices forward. So any clients who are really interested um, and want to see further iterations of their designs, um, there will be summer students who are hired on, into the lab and they'll actually do further iterations and work with that client to give them something that they could uh, take home and use at the end of the day, um, even if they didn't receive something that they could use initially during the course. Um, so some of the students who do that have been students in the course in the course who've uh, done that, and also some of the clients are really interested in potentially working on other devices in future years. Like they might come back and say, "Oh, we want to work on something that'll help with this instead of uh, what we did last year." Um, so that's a lot of times people are interested in that, and so we will work forward with them uh, as best we can. Yara, would you like to go next? Well, I, I think just to add about the core design aspect and the participatory, uh, what, what it really means, I think the question was also about that, that doing it together is amazing um, and, and it's needed. And I mean, interdisciplinary, but also definitely that like BBT, it, we we cannot do it with a, without an input from from the person that actually requires the, the device. It's set up in such a way, 
Um, and participatory really means being involved in, when I think about research in different uh, stages, right, of the research, not only, oh, you help us um, with a design or you, um, at the beginning of the research project, or but being uh, involved throughout the research project and also, also, also with knowledge dissemination and, and um, transfer at the end of the research and what we learn about. So I hope I, I got the question. And, uh, correct. <laughs> yeah, I'd have to agree that um, that's definitely, at least from the BBT perspective, that's definitely something that um, that we do try to continue on with is, is um, trying to get as much feedback from the clients as possible. Um, if we work for the older clients, a lot of them are just generally happy to be talking to people. There was one lady, it was the cutest thing. She came in with a photo from um, when she was 18 years old and we're, we're at Queens. And there was a photograph of her in a bikini from like um, the early 1900s. And it was just so funny to see. I mean, she, she was quite an elderly lady. And it was just so cute that she was so proud of herself to have this, this newspaper clipping of her with, in a bikini that many years ago. And she brought it in to show it off to the students. So it, it's, it's as they enjoy it a lot from that perspective, especially with the older individuals. Some of the kids are, some of the kids, once they start being able to play Nintendo or Nintendo Switch or have their controllers that look the way they want them to in the right color, they get very excited. So I think it's it's that they do actually use the devices. We have followed up with a few people. We haven't followed up with all of them. Um, when we were working with older people, we actually found that um, as you followed up, we actually lost track of them and some of them ended up in hospital, which made it a little bit more difficult and, and heart-wrenching to be honest, to, to see them move through that stage of their lives. Um, but it is something that um, we were intending and we would like to, to do is to, to reach out to them more often. We did have a student who was going to do that. And um, unfortunately, she moved on to, to another occupational therapy position. Um, so it is one of those things that we'd like to get. And when you look at it from the AAC perspective as well, though, um, we were talking about um, getting feedback from focus groups from these individuals. This is a whole concept of that knowledge mobilization is that um, Beata was talking about as well, is ensuring that everybody knows what's going on and knows that we're actually trying to, to improve these standards um, through the Accessible Canada Act. So they are going to contribute to that improvement and those guidelines in the development of this act. And so I think that's the biggest, the biggest promo for us that we could actually use. Uh, but we do try to ensure that um, we will give them some feedback as we go along as to how things are going. We will publish this information and we will provide it to policy um, developers so that we can actually say, well, these are the issues that we've observed with the system. Can we do something about that? And so that is what we are trying to do as we move forward is actually do some system, systemic changes to the um, ways technology is developed and used and provided to end users, uh, whether it be AAC communication tools, whether it be um, brain computer interfaces, whether it be things developed in the BBT, we want to ensure that what they've always got some form of access and that we're, we're trying to make that change as much as possible. Um, as I say, we've, we've um, engage 1200 students in this program of developing new technologies and ensuring that they're meeting with stakeholders so that's that's got to go somewhere <laughs> and it's got to help in the long run and so i think that's that's the other um side of things is, is just making everybody engaged and and willing to learn and willing to talk to new people so i think that's pretty much always the question um, and we're at 2.15 and then, oh, Tarek has something? Yeah, well, actually I was gonna thank yeah. you, but just as a last sort of reflection of what you've just said there, you know, I think what your panel has really brought forward in various different ways is that power also of the post-secondary settings and spaces to those education pieces, right? Like how is it that we can um, in, give a culture of uh, working with others, other disciplines and connecting with community and respecting actually the innovations that come out of those communities and give a shout out to those too, right? Some of the things that are being created in, in um, post-secondary spaces are actually 
coming out of those consultations with communities. So even giving those shout outs to really say where those innovations are coming from disability communities is really important. And I think we've often spent a lot of time at post-secondary helping to ingrain a sense of identity within uh, the profession that one might be training for, uh, you know, like if we take, as you said, you know, engineering, for, for instance, it's getting, you know, tight with your group and understanding. And, and so we've spent a lot of time in that. And really what you're talking about is kind of deconstructing that in a way and really helping people get a sense of identity as a collaborator and working collaboratively with others and as a community engager and getting those skills and proficiencies. And I think that's, you're right, that's gonna be really something that's uh, gonna help the sustainability of this as well. So thank you so much for all of you, um, your great insights that you provided to us today through this. Uh, Claire, I'm, I'm gonna kind of set us into the next piece, but is there anything else you, you wanted to say as a wrap up? No, just thank you very much for having us. And we really enjoyed this opportunity. Great, yeah. Well, it was fantastic to have you here today with us. So now uh, to everyone else who is out there and has uh, gotten a chance to enjoy this, um, I wanna let you know that we're actually gonna take um, a 25 minute break.